Okay, good afternoon everyone. This is the flipped classroom video for chapter four on chemical bonding. Okay, so this particular chapter is going to build upon the things that we have already started. Um, our focus here is to go beyond the electric structure and start looking at how things interact with one another. Um, we'll try and do this in about a half hour, or I'll get through as much as I can in a half hour, and maybe have to split this into two different videos. So our learning objectives here, primarily, number one is to draw Lewis structures. Um, this is the bulk of where this chapter is going to go. So if you're going to be studying on this chapter, this is probably one of the biggest sections to, to focus on is the Lewis structures. Now we want to be able to recognize and use formal charges to determine structures. Now keep in mind that on the test, you are not going to have to draw structures. So this means that you have to be able to recognize the proper structures when drawn and or be able to recognize when there is resonance. Okay, so usually these are structural things that you can uh, apply and pick out which one is the proper structure. And then the molecular geometry is mostly memorization. So we will use the Lewis structure in order to translate into a three-dimensional structure. So the Lewis structure is a 2D, usually linear diagram. Um, and then we'll translate that into the 3D structures. And then we can also look at some very basic polarity. Now we're not gonna to go too deep into the polar molecules. So they will be relatively simple, things like binary molecules. Okay, so we wanna be able to differentiate proper Lewis structures. So we have to be able to draw Lewis structures. Most of this particular bonding theory is from G. N. Lewis essentially established this based on the valence electrons. Now we talked previously in the previous chapter about valence electrons. Valence electrons are dealing with our S and our P electrons so that they make up our, our eight outer electrons. So we have to remember that those, the transition metals in the middle were three, they started, scandium started at 3D, which comes after the 4S, uh, so any of the transition metals are lower in energy than the, at any point, than the level we're already at. So if you're in the 3D, you've already hit 4S, which is a higher energy level. So it's a higher level. So those, so those would represent the outer electrons, so our transition metal elements. We're not going to worry about those. It's going to be our S and our Ps are going to be our valence electrons. So we have to know how many valence electrons everything has before we start. Okay, so the outer layer, the valence electrons, will go in sequence across the board. And generally what we're gonna be looking for is a completion of what we call the octet, okay, which is your S and your P electrons. So your S electrons, there's two electrons. For your P electrons, you have six. So you do a total of eight. Generally, when we are bonding things, what they are looking to do is to fill those octets. So just like when we looked at in the previous chapter, when we were looking at the electron configurations, we know this, that there are variations in the electron configurations where they're either full, like a noble gas, they are empty, as in like an ion that might lose electrons in order to get rid of an outer layer, or they may be half full, so full, empty, and half are the three optimal arrangements for, for these. Okay, so when we look at something like beryllium, okay, so we, so we have the 1s2 and the 2s2, okay? So these are the 2s2 electrons here, and these represent the outer layer, or what we would call our valence electrons. So the inner, inner layer is, is irrelevant. It's the, the outer layer of the onion, essentially, that we're looking at. Okay, here we look at fluorine. Fluorine has seven valence electrons. The outer layer, okay, there's your 1s2, 2s2, 2p2, 
2p4, 2p5. So it's missing one of its to get to 2p6, okay, to complete its octet. All right. Now, the way the Lewis dot diagrams are drawn is we should be familiar with the electron configuration as from the previous chapter. So each element is generally drawn and then a dot is drawn to represent its number of valence electrons. So however many valence electrons it has, that's how many dots it gets, okay? So you can see sodium has one valence electron. It's like 3s1 or 2s1 electron is right there. And then magnesium has two valence electrons, aluminum three, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, down to argon having eight. Okay, and so this is gonna be the same trend for the whole family. All of the halogens, like fluorine, are gonna have seven valence electrons. Okay, and so again, this is just kind of reminding back to what I had just spoken about, where those energy levels are not the outer la layer, so we don't have to worry about the transition. All right, so how do we go about drawing a Lewis structure? Okay, the first step is we need to know how many valence electrons are there. Okay, so each element, we count up how many valence electrons it has. So if you have carbon dioxide, so you'd have carbon and two oxygens. So carbon has four valence electrons, oxygen has six, and there are two of them. Okay, so you total up all the valence electrons and whatever the molecule is you draw must have that number of valence electrons. Okay, so generally we will pick a central atom, okay? Uh, how you pick the central atom is, we'll get into it more as we do some of the practice problems. Generally some rules to go by is hydrogen is never gonna be a central atom, okay? Uh, generally the more electronegative, the more terminal it will be. So sometimes in a chemical structure, the first atom written is also the central atom. You may also look at when there's in a structure, if there's only one of them, that's probably a good indicator that one electron or that one element is going to be the central atom. So we wanna pick the central atom and then draw a basic structure that attaches all of the other things to our central atom, okay? Um, it's not always the same thing because we can have, we'll look at some examples later where we have our molecules that have more than one central atom. So you see that in like the organic molecules where you're gonna have multiple carbons in a row. But again, you don't have to draw those structures, they'll, they'll be given for you, okay? All right, so once we have a central atom and a, a bond, you'll see, you'll see how this is drawn in a minute. And again, this is part of what we're going to do in class is to go through and just work on drawing Lewis structures. So around the outside electrons, or around the outside elements, you wanna start on the outside and start giving the elements eight electrons, okay? The bonds that connect them to the center count as two, okay? So in carbon dioxide, carbon would have one bond to an oxygen and one bond to another oxygen. And that one bond counts as two electrons, okay? So if we're giving dots around the oxygen then, the bond already counts as two, and then so you would have to put six more electrons around it in order to give it eight, okay? So we, keep, so we give everybody eight, and then we head to the central atom, and then if, if there's electrons still to, to give, then we give those to the central atom. Okay, so by the time that you've given all the elements their electrons, okay, again, the total number of electrons you have to distribute is the total number of valence electrons, right? So if you have eight valence electrons, that's all you've got to put around your molecule. You don't get new, new electrons from somewhere. So doling out electrons, you can only give up to your total, okay? So let's look at an example here for water, okay? So water, okay, oxygen has six 
valence electrons. Okay, hydrogen has one valence electron, and there's two of them. So we have a total of eight valence electrons. Our central atom is chosen as oxygen here. Again, generally the rule was is the electro more electronegative elements are not going to be your central atom. However, hydrogen can't be the central atom. So in that case, oxygen is the only one that can be the central atom. Right? So we draw a single bond between the two, and so the, each one of these bonds counts as two electrons. Okay, And hydrogen doesn't get extra electrons, so there is no electrons to distribute around the hydrogen, so we're going to continue and then give the oxygen its electrons. And so then we want to do a count. Okay, So each hydrogen has a bond, that's all it gets. Okay, and then we want to count, so it's two, four, six, eight total electrons. So this would be the Lewis dot structure for hydrogen. Now, you'll notice later when we get to the 3D structure, it doesn't quite look like this, but again, the Lewis structure, it doesn't have to be perfect. It's meant to be a, a rudimentary model of what it looks like. Okay, look at carbon. So here we have a carbon, hydrogen, and three chlorines, okay? Um, you have carbon has four valence electrons, hydrogen has one, and chlorine has seven, and there's three of them. So we have a total of 26 valence electrons. So then when we're done with our model, we should end up with 26 electrons. Carbon is the least electronegative, given that hydrogen can't have uh, be a central atom. All right, so also, Generally, carbon tends to be a central atom. Okay, so that's another kind of thing to look at is if you have a choice, generally carbon is a good choice to make for a central atom other, over other elements. Okay, so we draw carbon with the center and all the bonds around it, okay, with everything attached to it. All right, usually in the organic structure, uh, after, when, after the carbon, the carbon, and then everything after, listed after the carbon is what's attached to that carbon, right? So if Sometimes there's hydrogens listed out front, um, but, but then this carbon is attached to another carbon or something like that. So usually the organic structure with carbon tries to give you some idea of what is the layout of the electrons or a layout of the other elements. Okay. So here we go ahead and we give eight to the outer electron, to the outer elements. Okay. So hydrogen only has the one bond, that's all it's going to get but we give chlorine eight electrons. So there's two for the bond, four, six, eight. Two, four, six, eight. Two, four, six, eight. And so when we total up all of the electrons in our model, we've used up all of our electrons, okay? The central atom has its octet, okay? Carbon has an octet. If it doesn't have an octet, then, then that's when we have, generally have to make some readjustments, okay? And so this becomes the Lewis structure, the proper Lewis structure for this molecule. All right, formaldehyde, okay? Same kind of thing. We have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen here. I don't know if my video is in the way here. Mm -hmm. So carbon has four valence electrons, hydrogen has one, oxygen has six. So I have a total of 12 valence electrons. All right, so here's the, here's, here's the question that becomes a which one should be the central atom, carbon or oxygen? Well, in this case, carbon, as I said, is usually a, a good choice to go with as a central atom. Uh, also, oxygen is more electronegative, so it's probably not going to be the choice of the central atom over, over carbon. So carbon here, we choose to be the central atom. We make a single bond to all of its components. Okay, so that's two, four, six. That's six of its total 12, right? We can't make a molecule that's more than 12, right? We've used six, right? We distribute the rest around the oxygen, okay? So there's two, four, six more, right? So that's two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. That's all the, that's all the electrons we had to deal with. However, our central atom does not have an octet. So this means we have to move electrons to ensure that the central atom does have an octet, okay? So this is where two of these electrons from the oxygen are going to move over here and create a double bond, okay?
Okay. And so now the double bond carbon has is going to feel the electrons of this bond. So everybody gets, everybody feels like they've got the full bond, right? So hydrogen's got, got two, it's got two, but this carbon now has these two, four. Each one of these is counted as two. So two and two, right? So it has a total of eight around it from, from the bonds around it. Oxygen now has two, four, six, eight around it as well. Okay, and so this becomes our Lewis structure for formaldehyde. All right, as I alluded to, we get to carbon dioxide. Okay, so carbon has four valence electrons, oxygen has six, and there's two oxygen, so we have a total of 16 valence electrons. Carbon is the least electronegative of, of, the, of the pair, but it's also, there's only one of them. So again, that's also another good indicator that that's gonna be the central atom, okay? A single bond between the two. So that's a total of four electrons out of our 16. So we have 12 left over, okay? Giving carbon the remaining, so that we're putting our electrons around the outside first. So that's two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, okay? So we've used up all of our electrons we have none left. We had 16 valence electrons. We've used up 16 in our model. However, carbon doesn't have an octet. Okay, we can't leave the central atom, or we shouldn't leave the central atom with no octet. And so electrons are going to move from the oxygen here to make a double bond. Okay, and that oxygen and then electrons from over here will move and make a double bond. And then so that will give carbon a total of eight electrons around. Okay, now we have some choices here that we'll look at later as we get to things like the formal charge, and we may just do this in the class, where we can look at, well, what if I choose to do a triple bond, like move two electrons from here and two more from here and make a triple bond to carbon. That would also satisfy carbon in making a total of four bonds around carbon, um, but it may, you know, but and it would still complete our octet and it still makes 16 electrons, but it's not favorable, but we haven't gotten to how we can know that. Okay, so here is a chlorite ion, all right? So what you're gonna notice here is the ion, all right? So let me move my thing here, all right? So you'll notice there's a charge here. Okay, so when we're doing things that have an ionic charge, this is just going to, affect, the only way, way this plays a role is when we're doing our Lewis structure, or I mean, is doing the valence electron count, okay? So chlorine has seven, oxygen has six, and there's two of them, and that charge, that charge adds an extra electron into our mix, okay? So we have one extra electron that gets in there because of that negative charge. So we have a total of 20 valence electrons. So realistically, in most of these models that you're gonna have, they probably shouldn't have an odd number. Now that's not to say that they can't, but we probably shouldn't have an odd number for, for, for any of these molecules, okay? All right, so we've given chlorine the central. Chlorine is the lesser electronegative. It's also the only one of them. So chlorine is gonna be our central atom, a bond to both that uses four. So we have 16 remaining. Okay, so here we put everything around the oxygen. So it's two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, right? So we put 16 around. We have four left over, okay, because we have 20. And so we put the other two or the other four around the chlorine, right? You'll notice the brackets with the negative charge listed there. Because when you're doing the, when you're doing the Lewis structures, there's no other way to know that it was an ion unless you indicate that it is in fact an ion by putting the brackets with the charge on the outside, okay? And so this becomes the Lewis structure. So we have 20 valence electrons here distributed around our three elements, okay? So looking at shared and unshared so again, the shared ones are simply when there's a, a single bond, okay? So the hydrazine here, the shared ones are simply, again, it's a single bond. They are shared between two elements. So there's one bond, 
two, three, four, five bonds, right? So five single bonds is, makes up the shared number. So it's, each bond is two electrons. So there are 10 shared electrons. And then the electrons just on the nitrogens are not shared with anyone else other than just the nitrogen. And so you have four unshared, or we call lone pairs. Sometimes they, they often count uh, pairs of electrons in these models. Okay, same thing here for the cyanide or hydrogen cyanide. So we have a single bond, a triple bond, and a lone pair. So the triple bond has two, four, six electrons in it, plus the single bond, so that's eight electrons. So that's eight shared electrons through the two bonds, and then one lone pair or two electrons. All right, so resonance and formal charge. Like I said, the formal charge is more of a tool that we're going to use. Ooh, quite a glare in here. All right. Um, so formal charge is how we're going to determine what is the best structure? Like I said, if you decided that you wanted to use a triple bond for, for something instead of a double bond, like for carbon dioxide, if we're gonna do a triple bond instead of two, two, uh, two double bonds, how would you know which one's the right one? So formal charge is gonna help us to determine that. Yeah, let's see if that helps. All right, so resonance, resonance is something that occurs when we have choices. Like if you have a choice of where to put a double bond in a molecule, generally there, there is the development of resonance. Resonance is a way to stabilize multiple bonds, as you'll see when we start looking at formal charge, how, how resonance really helps, okay? So this is what resonance looks like. And so when you look at carbonate, it has one double bond. Okay, but when you're making this molecule and you're deciding, okay, well, uh, carbon doesn't have an octet, so we need to take one pair of electrons from the oxygen and move it to, to the carbon so that it has a, an octet. But which one do you pick from? Do you pick from you know, this oxygen, or do you pick from this oxygen, or do you pick from this oxygen? Well, it turns out that it doesn't really matter. So what happens is, as this one donates its two electron to make the double bond, it becomes, as we'll, we'll see in the formal charge, it, the formal charge here becomes stable, okay? Oxygen generally prefers to have two bonds. So that means that this oxygen now is mm, it's a little unstable. It's not, it's unfavorable in this, in this system, and we'll, so you'll see that in a minute. And so what happens is this bond is going to move, he jumps over here, and now this oxygen feels stable. And then these two don't. And then it's going to rotate again over here. And then now this one feels stable. And so it's kind of like a game of hot potato except at light speed. So the electrons are going to, the double bond is going to bounce around this molecule endlessly. So it's almost like they're getting, they, they feel stable. Okay, so resonance is a way of stabilizing the bonds. So it keeps this one that's not as stable or not as favorable, and it tries to lessen the effect of that unfavorability, okay? Because you had a choice of where you were, where you were, were drawing this, but in reality, the bond doesn't just stay in one spot. There's not one of these as the correct structure, okay? And so what you see is, is oftentimes in some books they will write it this way. This is what is called a hybrid structure. So it's kind of showing this dash here as a line where this isn't a real double bond. It's showing that this is kind of a, again, a temporary double bond, that it has a temporary one and it's kind of double bonded to all three oxygens, but not really, okay? It doesn't have three triple bonds or three double bonds, right? It's, it's a fake bond, right? So it, it rotates around to, to stabilize the formal charge of these other oxygens, All right? Here's the nitrate, nitrite ion. You have nitrogen with five valence electrons, oxygen with six, there's two of them. 
and there's a charge on this molecule. So the negative is adds an extra electron. Okay, so nitrogen is a central atom, two bonds, that uses up four of our electrons. We distribute our electrons around. Okay, and so we end up with two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16. All right, so we've used to 16, so we have two left over. Those are gonna go on the nitrogen, but that doesn't give nitrogen an octet. Nitrogen has two, four, six. So the question is, is, well, who's going to give nitrogen two more so he feels like he has an octet? In this case, we, they chose this oxygen donates two electrons, all right? Now nitrogen has two, four, six, eight electrons around it, okay? But it could very well have been the other way, okay? So this is generally how you know that there is resonance is that there was a choice where you would put the double bond. Could have put it on this side or I could have put it on this side. You're gonna have a resonance structure that develops as a result of that, okay? And so here are the two resonance structures, okay? One where we chose the, the double bond with this oxygen and one where we chose the double bond with this oxygen. All right, so formal charge is how you're going to determine which is the proper structure when there are equivalent structures, okay? So it allows us to check the validity of a Lewis structure, right? So this doesn't work if, if on the test, the question is which one is the proper Lewis structure and it's asking about A is methane and B is formaldehyde and C is sulfate. It's not gonna help you with that, okay? They have to be the same structure, okay? So the question is, if you have carbon dioxide with two, sing two double bonds or a carbon dioxide with a triple and a single, formal, you know, formal charge can help you determine which one of those two equivalent structures of carbon dioxide is the proper structure, okay? So this is how we're gonna do it, okay? So it is the valence electrons. All right, so this equation is, it's, this is a little more complicated than it needs to be. Okay, so the number of valence electrons minus the number of bonds, okay? A shared electron is a bond. Divided by two is just, you know, counting half of the, the shared bonds. So if you just count the bonds, right? A single bond has two electrons. So one bond has, you know, divided by two or two electrons and a bond divided by two is one. Right? So you want you to just count the bonds. So if it's a single bond, you just count the bonds. Right? So the valence electrons minus the number of bonds minus the, the free electrons or unshared electrons, the free dots, any dots around the element. Okay? All right. So let's look at this one here. Okay? Oxygen here. Let's look at the oxygen. Right? So oxygen has six valence electrons. Okay? It has two bonds, right? So this is what you're saying here is, I'm just counting how many bonds it has. So here, according to this complicated model, it's, oh, let's count out how many total electrons there are. There's four, because there's two bonds there, and take half of that, and then add the dots. Well, or you can simplify it and just say, oxygen has six valence electrons. There's two bonds, so minus two, minus the four dots around it equals zero, okay? So it's a little easier if you just count the bonds, okay? Carbon has four valence electrons. It has four bonds around it and no free electrons, okay? Nitrogen has five valence electrons minus two bonds minus four dots. So five minus two minus four is negative one, okay? So here's the negative one on the nitrogen, okay? As you have alternative structures, so this is with the double bond, so you could have in B drawn the cyanide, like a cyanide, like a C triple bond, N, okay? In this case, the oxygen now has six valence electrons, 
with one bond. So that's five minus two, four, six more dots. So it's a total of negative one on the oxygen. Okay. Carbon still is zero because it has four bonds around it. Nitrogen now, five valence electrons minus three bonds minus two free electrons with a zero. Okay. Over here, now we have the oxygen with a plus one, carbon still zero, nitrogen's negative two. So we have these three identical structures, okay, or three, if you count the valence electrons of each one of these, they're going to come out the same in, in, all, in all of them, okay? So what we want to do is you want to look for the one with the fewest number or the most zeros, okay? The most zeros is going to be the most, is the more stable structure, okay? Zero, zero, negative one. Zero, zero, negative one. Zero, two, one. So C is automatically eliminated as a possible choice because there are, there are fewer zeros here, okay? So there are fewer elements that are happy, okay? So C is eliminated. So it comes down to this one. Is it A or is it B? Now these are 50-50 because they both have two zeros and a negative one. So here, where the negative charge is going to reside is on the more electronegative element. Okay, so the question is, which one is more electronegative, oxygen or nitrogen? In this case, oxygen is more electronegative. And so the preferred structure is going to be B. Okay, so this is the preferred, more reasonable structure is where you have the negative charge on the more electronegative element. Okay. skip through some of these. Okay, so obviously there are exceptions to these octet rules and things. Um, things like beryllium and boron, they're never going to have eight around them, so they can't. So they're okay with having a structure like this, like this is perfectly fine for beryllium. He uses up his two valence electrons in a bond, and that's it. You know, boron, oh, boron's a nonmetal. He has three valence electrons and makes three bonds and that's it okay um, there are examples of what we call free radicals where there is a lone so you'll notice this electron is not paired this electron is not paired you're not going to see these as, as examples. These are just things that, that happen in these structures that was I was saying the you don't always have a a total even number. And so these are called free radicals. They are generally very reactive and they generally don't last for very long. Okay, so they generally want to bond with something. Okay. All right, so let's talk about the geometry here. Um, all right, so a lot of this is going to be memorization. Okay, so this is based on what's called the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, or VSEPR. So the key here that you have to remember is right here in the middle, okay? electrons occupy a physical space. So anytime that you saw those lone pairs of electrons, like on the nitrogen, where it had two dots on it, they're gonna occupy a physical space. Now, electrons may be very small, but they occupy a physical space as if there was something there. Oftentimes, more space than if there was something there. So that occupying space means that it affects the 3D distribution of the elements, okay? So these, so what you need to know here are the geometry names, okay? So the electron geometry is something that is like the, we call the base geometry or the root geometry. Um, generally these are where everything is derived from. So the molecular geometry, so most of these tend to be 
like a subset. So like bent is a subset of trigonal planar. So if you look at this molecule here, trigonal planar has three elements around it, okay, around the central atom. Now, if you took one of these off, okay, if you took this top one off, then you would get this bottom structure, okay? So this bottom structure is called bent. So it's a sub-geometry of this main geometry trigonal planar. So basically what you need to know is the geometry names and the bond angles, okay? And we continue down here. This is for trigonal bipyramidal, okay? All right, so let's talk about the beginning. All right, so linear is the simplest geometry with just a central atom and two things attached to it. So we saw CO2, carbon dioxide, then we have trigonal planar. We have three things attached to, to the central atom. Okay, so three things. Then we have tetrahedral. So this one's important. This one is the geometry of carbon or of methane here. So it has four things attached to a central atom, tetrahedral. It has, it has two subsets, trigonal pyramidal and bent. So you'll notice there's two that are called bent because they look very similar to one another. And as it loses, as you take off a bonding pair, so look, if you look at the methane here, if you take off a bonding pair, it still retains its general structure. And so the bond angle, and, that, and that's reason why it's keeping that general structure is because on the top here are electrons. And there's electrons on the top of this nitrogen that are keeping that structure, keeping these things pushed away. And it actually pushes these things a little bit closer together, so it actually occupies more space than some, something like an, a hydrogen. Okay. Again, if these were the only two things there and those electrons didn't occupy any space, then you wouldn't see the hydrogens sitting right next to one another. You know, the two hydrogens don't want to sit next to one another. They would want to occupy as much space as possible in the molecule. So they, they would pop out to be a linear thing. But since they're bent, you know, they're being pushed together. That means those two hydrogens are being pushed into a, where they're almost kind of touching each other. And they don't like that. They don't, they want to repel from one another. So they would want to occupy as much space as possible. But th there's something pushing them, keeping them like that. And that's, that's electron pairs that are on, that are on the top of that molecule. Okay. So with five bond pairs, this is called trigonal bipyramidal. And so this is with five things. And so this is obviously beyond our octet. So we see like phosphorus pentachloride. Okay. So this one has two different set setups. So it has an axial, an axis, and an equatorial region. Okay. So it has a couple different bond angles. It's 90 degrees from the top. There are 120 around the, equ around the equatorial region. And then obviously 180 between the top and the bottom. Okay. Now, if you take one off, now all of the subsets are taking things off the equator, okay? It's going to remove stuff off the equator, right? Because that gives the electron pairs the most amount of room, okay? So you get seesaw, T-shaped, and then after you've taken all three of the linear ones uh, off the, the equator, you get a linear format. Okay, and the last one is octahedral, where we have six things bonded to it, okay? So like SF6, okay? So here, the bond angles are all pretty much 90 degrees. Okay, I mean, it's 180 from the top and bottom, obviously. Okay, so the square pyramidal is where you've taken one of these off, and so it pushes everything a little bit closer together. And then the last one is square planar, and we get back to 90 and 180, because now you've got something pushing up down from the, the electron pair on the top, an electron pair on the bottom, and they're both pushing, pushing everything together, and so it keeps everything nice and flat. Okay. So you'll also see kind of this generic geometry designation, AX2, okay? So that means A is the central atom and two X is how many things are attached to it, okay? All right, so here we have the trigonal planar. Here we have three things attached to it. So you have AX3, okay? So the central atom with three things. And so their bond angle here is 120, all right? Its subset was bent, so here you can see, this is a good, good model right here at the A and the B, right? Is you got this electron pair, okay? This is what's causing B to still be in this kind of geometry. Whereas if this wasn't pulling, pushing these away, it wasn't repelling these things, then these would come up to occupy as much space as possible, which is 180, okay? Tetrahedral, so the AX4 is tetrahedral. So all the bonds here are 109.5. Again, this is similar to carbon. 
So when you have diamond, they're all tetrahedrally bonded to one another. Okay. All right, so one thing to, to look at here real quick is this other kind of drawing, right? So sometimes you'll see kind of these bold lines or kind of a dotted line. These are still single bonds. It's just that they're trying to represent this model in a three-dimensional way. Okay, so these are not different kinds of bonds. They're just single bonds, but they're meant to show like the bold one means like the, the bond is like coming towards you and the, and the dotted one line is like the bond going back, right? So they're trying to show you a tetrahedral bond here, but to try and represent these as being three-dimensional, okay? Okay, trigonal pyramidal, again, is if we took one off the tetrahedral, this one is important because this is what methane looks like. Okay, um, bent, so this is again a tetrahedral arrangement. So here you'll see the, the central atom has two things attached to it and then there's two pairs of electrons. So this is uh, one of those subsets. So this is what we see for water. Okay, as the, the trigonal bipyramidal AX5, all right, has two different orientations. All of the subsets involve taking off these X's in the middle, okay, taking off these middle equatorial spots. So the electron pairs, okay, when you take, take things off, they're gonna come off this middle area, okay? So there's the seesaw one, one came off, another one came off, and then linear in the middle, okay? Octahedral, same kind of thing, okay? All right, so really what you need to do is memorize most of those geometries. Now we're gonna go over them, we'll do some practice problems in class, how do we find out the geometry from, 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 the, from the Lewis structure. So we'll practice with some Lewis structures and then we'll practice converting them to, to, to their geometries, okay? Polarity is really just when there's an uneven distribution of electrons based on things like electronegativity, okay? So like, HF. So we know fluorine is very electronegative and hydrogen is not. So this becomes a what we call a polar bond because hydrogen is unevenly, all the electrons are unevenly distributed. Okay. So here fluorine gets the bulk of all of the, the electrons, whereas hydrogen has very little electron density. Okay. Whereas when fluorine or fluoride or fluorine is bond bonded to another fluorine, then they, they're evenly distributed. And so you get a, you know, a pure covalent molecule. There's, there's no difference in their, their electronegativity, so nobody wins, okay? And so really what you just have to be able to look at is, is look, at it, look at two molecules and try to just determine whether or not they would be polar, okay? And so really the way to know how, if they're polar, we're looking for really non-metals, okay? So you're looking for covalent molecules and you're looking for their distance on the periodic table to be far apart from one another. So the further they are, the more likely there is some polarity involved, okay? The closer they are, hmm, probably the less in the polarity they, they get to be, okay? So when they are the same, so oxygen here would be like a nonpolar covalent. So when you have two oxygens, okay? So, but as soon as you put oxygen and like chlorine, Okay, oxygen's more electronegative than chlorine is, and so it's, there's gonna be some po you know, polar covalent molecule, but as you separate them further, and then you get to oxygen and aluminum, they become ionic. So once the electronegativity separates so much, then they become a, an ionic bond, okay? So it, things that affect polarity are things like symmetry, Okay, so like carbon dioxide, okay? So carbon dioxide had the two oxygens on either side, but it, there's not a side of this molecule that's particularly like one side's negative and one side's positive, right? That's what you need for polarity, all right? So if you look at water, water has a lot of electrons at the top, not a lot of electrons at the bottom. So water becomes what we call a polar molecule, okay? Whereas carbon dioxide is nonpolar, all right? And so we can look at, so you're probably not gonna look at things like this on, on the test. It's probably gonna be simpler molecules, okay? So like more like the 
HF example on the water, probably carbon dioxide kind of stuff is, that's the kind of polarity that, that we'll be looking at trying to determine is which one is polar is more based on very simple molecules. Okay, and again, we'll practice some of these in class. Okay, all right, so, um, look at the other videos. Okay, there's a whole bunch of other videos that look at practice problems. We are going to practice practice problems in the class, but I would suggest um, at least giving some of them a try. Uh, bring some questions with you to class if you've tried some practice problems in your book and you're unsure of which ones you want, uh, how they got the structure that they did, we can do them in class. Uh, we'll work together in groups and we'll try and put just more focus on practicing do, doing these things rather than me just explaining this again. So you should have watched this video before you come to class, before we, for, for when we do chapter four, okay? All right, so uh, that is it for this lecture. And I'm gonna go ahead, I'll post this video up and then we'll, you know, try from here. And, you know, if this works, you know, you guys can let me know after we're done, all right? All right, reach up you know, re read the bonding chapter in whichever book you have. Some of the older books, it's maybe chapter 10. It's been nine and 10 are sometimes the older books uh, chapters if you're looking at the older books, okay? All right, see you guys in class.